Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church. And this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one weighing in on the current controversy about communion. Who deserves it? Graham Greene, the Catholic British author, wrote a short story entitled A Hint of an Explanation that has haunted me ever since I read it years and years and years ago. In brief, the story goes like this. A youngster is seduced by the village atheist, a butcher named, appropriately enough perhaps, Blacker, to steal a consecrated wafer. The lad is to take the host into his mouth at Mass, but to spit it out as soon as he returns to his pew in a bit of newspaper and then give it to uh, the atheist after service has concluded. Blacker has promised the boy a train set if he follows the instructions, but has promised dire, dire consequences if he doesn't. Well, the lad does exactly what Blacker wants him to do, and when Blacker comes to the lad's house later on that day to fetch the wafer, the boy has a crisis of conscience, conscience and he, instead of giving the wafer to Blacker, swallows it, and Blacker wails in despair and goes away. I've often thought, as a priest, what I would have done had I known that such a caper was on, would I have given communion to the boy if I had known that the boy was going to pass the wafer on to Blacker the Atheist for some nefarious purpose? It's a troubling question. And it's been on my mind lately precisely because the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has raised the question of who deserves communion, under what circumstances a person deserves to take the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ during the liturgy of the Eucharist. The USCCB, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, is planning on issuing a document this November and that document purportedly is to express concern over the fact that many Roman Catholics no longer believe in the fact that the uh, bread and wine becomes the body and blood of our Lord. That's all fine and good. Clarification about the Eucharist is always welcome. But there are reports that some of the bishops want to use the document as a weapon to deny communion to those public leaders and elected officials who defend abortion. And the obvious first target is President Joe Biden. Now, I do not want to get into the morality of abortion. It is an extremely complicated topic. Perhaps I can do that in a future Holy Spirit moment. But for right now, what I would like to do is to explore the question of who deserves communion. Would it be legitimate to deny communion to an elected official who supports abortion, who supports Roe versus Wade? I don't think so. And I don't think so for a number of reasons, even though I must tell you that I am conflicted about this question. But here are my reasons. The first reason is what Pope Francis himself has given us. The Eucharist is intended as medicine, not as a reward. Jesus himself said that he came for the sick, not for the healthy. And the body of our Lord is precisely that medicine that has been handed to us over the last 2,000 years whenever we attend Mass. I am absolutely positive that there was no litmus test of moral goodness at the Last Supper. Jesus offered himself to all of the apostles, including Judas Iscariot, including Peter, who would betray him just a few hours later, including Thomas the Doubter, who would doubt the resurrection. The Eucharist is intended to help us grow into our godlike image and the body of Christ. It's not a medal or a reward for good behavior. The Roman Canon 915 states that the Eucharist can be denied to anyone who, quote, obstinately perseveres in manifest grave sin. 
but of unquote. But of course, that begs the question of what manifold grave sin is, much less what obstinately persevering in it is. This again touches upon the moral debate about abortion. Until we can absolutely definitively determine that abortion is a manifest grave sin, all aspects of abortion are equally um, immoral, then it seems to me the best thing to do when it comes to distributing communion is simply to give the benefit of the doubt. There's another reason for uh, not uh, um, refusing the communion to anyone, and that's this. We just honestly do not know what is in another person's heart. We don't judge a person. We evaluate his or her actions. There is no window that we have into his or her soul. We do not know what effect partaking of communion might have upon an individual who is morally troubled. Moreover, it seems to me that if we insist on denying the sacrament to some people for whatever reason, that we're denying the power of the sacrament. Once again, it's not intended as a reward for those who are morally righteous. It is intended as medicine for all of us. And to somehow withhold the sacrament is to presume that it doesn't have the power to mitigate whatever spiritual illness we might be suffering from. Moreover, it seems to me that all of this ultimately will lead to a kind of tribalism and intra-church feuding that mirrors the tribalism and social feuding that the United States is suffering from right now. It is the case, I have no doubt about this, that there are some people who receive communion who are genuinely performing wicked actions or who are intending wicked actions. I still believe that we do not have the right to deprive them of communion, to refuse to offer them the body of our Lord. But it does seem to me to be perfectly appropriate and even obligatory for us to call out their wickedness, for us to counsel them privately, for us to urge them to mend their ways, and if necessary, to do so publicly. It is important and crucial for Christians to speak truth to power, whether that power be an individual who comes up to the communion rail, or whether it be an institution, or whether it be an entire society. So the bottom line, my friends, is this. The church has always taught that when we partake of the Eucharist, the image of God with which we are born is nourished and grows. That to partake of the Eucharist is to renew and refresh the charism that was bestowed upon us at our baptism. That to partake in the Eucharist, as St. Augustine said, is to become more and more like the one whom we worship. Would I have given communion to that lad had I known that he and Blacker intended to do something nefarious with the host? Yeah, I, I think I would have. And I would have done so trusting that the power of the sacrament can change even the most evil of hearts and that I have no right, therefore, to deny it to anyone. I pray that the USCCB, when it issues its document about the Eucharist in November, will take all of these things that I've said to you to heart and will refrain from insisting upon refusing communion to people who defend abortion. If abortion is immoral, there are ways to speak out against it other than denying people the opportunity to grow in Christ that the sacrament of communion offers. I'm Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. I invite you to subscribe to this series. Thank you so very much. God bless. I'll see you next time.